Whether you keep them in your home or love to see them in theirs, these are the creatures that bring us all together. Reptiles. Reptiles. We're going to be delving into the experiences of reptile lovers from around the block and around the world. This is the Reptile Talk Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is Jeremy Turgeon from Brassman Reptiles. And I'm Rob, and I'm creeping it real. And look at that. We have an intro now. I love it. I honestly <laughs> really enjoy it. So I was working on that during one of my days off so that we could make this fun, fun thing happen. I, and I'm, I'm happy that Rob likes it. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be very upset if Rob didn't like it. <laughs> He's like, well, I don't care what anyone else thinks. If it doesn't impress Rob, it doesn't impress anybody. <laughs> this is true. Well, Rob is also the co-host. So if yeah. he's not thrilled with it, then I'll hear about it later. I'm also picky. I'm very picky about everything. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm super, I'm, dude, I can't even describe to you how excited I am for tonight's episode. Yes, me like, too. Oh my goodness. Because if you don't know who this person is, you should know who this person Legit. is. Legit. Because he's like uh, the godfather of a lot of, you know, captive breeding in the United States for a lot of different species and someone I've looked up to for a long time. And I'm just like super geeked out to have him on the episode tonight. Jeremy, you want to tell him who we got oh, on yeah. tonight? Well, first, I want to preface by saying this is take two. This is. Of we, this because. We wanted to have him on. We had some technical difficulties. But we had some technical difficulties. So uh so we had to <laughs> we had to figure it out. It's also one of the reasons why we're on this platform. Yes. <laughs> for the podcast. Yeah, now. if you're wondering why we started streaming on YouTube, <laughs> it is because we get, couldn't get our other platform to work for us. Yeah. So but anyway, I'm hey. super excited because we're chatting with Keith McPeak tonight. So I'm gonna bring him on. Oh, oh, oh. Bam, Boom. Keith, what's going on, dude? Hey guys, how are you? We're I've been looking forward here. to this for a while. Yeah. Hell yeah. Oh my goodness. I can't, <laughs> I'm like super geeked out right now. Um, so for the people who might not know who you are, like, I don't know how you could be into like, uh, you know, any sort of amount of reptiles and not know who you are, but I see it on the Facebook group sometimes, which blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so for the people who might not know who you are, like what really got you started in reptiles? Because you kind of came from a background where, like your family had animals, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my uh, uncle was an, actually a veterinarian, but his, his passion was exotic. So he, he fueled the practice by being in an area that he took care of, um, you know, cows and horses and goats and chickens and all that kind of stuff for the farmers. But his passion was big cats. So, oh, you know, wow. as, a, as a young kid, I'd go up to his place. He was in Blairstown, New Jersey. And uh, I'd go up to his place and I'd be playing with tiger cubs and he'd have a black panther walking around in his house and, you know, all kinds of exotic cats. But I mean, you could go there and find a chimpanzee or um, just about any kind of an exotic animal because he was the guy, you know. And Damn. then we had actually a, a place close by that was one of those drive through parks at the time. It's probably in the mid 1970s. And he was actually the veterinarian for them, taking care of all their exotic stuff. So. Yeah, I was exposed to exotic animals from like day one. I mean, as far back as I can remember, you know, I was messing with something that was really cool to me and normal for me. And everybody else was just like, what the hell are you talking about? You played with, <laughs> you played with a lion cub. What do you mean? You know? Uh, yeah, no, it was all normal to me from day one. That's that's awesome, man. Yeah. I can't even fathom like having that be like your normal, yeah, like, the normal day to day. I just, yeah. I mean, then again, people probably think about that like me. Like when I was growing up, I had tarantulas and stuff, and they're like I cannot picture having tarantulas in my house. It's just not <laughs> the thing that I would right. do. <laughs> right, it's just normal for you. You know, you don't know any different. Exactly. People would look at me strange. I'm like, what is your problem? Doesn't everybody have a line? You know. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah where's your lion dude jeez yeah. freaking weirdo you know, yeah. that must make everyone else's house kind of a little bit more boring like you go over to your friend's house and you're like oh there's no lions over here no chimpanzees yeah. nothing not nothing not, we yeah. got a cat yeah. oh, okay. dude i'm just i'm just saying keith if i knew you back then we'd only be hanging out at your house that's all yeah. i'm saying it, it was definitely very cool you know for without a doubt and you know, there wasn't all the laws and regulations back then. So, you know, I always had a raccoon or a possum or this or that. And we'd run up there and, you know, he'd take care of it for me or whatever. So I always had some pretty cool stuff back in the day when I was really young that I can't even keep nowadays, you know. So I, mm -hmm. I miss the yesteryears for sure. Yeah, most definitely. It is, it is really crazy to think 
how how much has been taken away from us as far as the ability to keep different animals you know yeah i mean uh you know i i get it because i used i my i had a squirrel monkey you know and i just went into a local pet store for 25 bucks and bought a squirrel monkey you know and you don't what you didn't wow. yeah i'm telling i got a capuchin monkey and a squirrel monkey just by going into a pet store 25 Jeez. bucks and you know we had a good un- animal understanding but anybody could go in that store and buy that and not know how to take care of that animal right, so right. you know i i get the i get the you know restrictions nowadays but man if you can meet the criteria to own a uh, capucha monkey you know you, know, you should be able to own one you know if they're I being agree, bred yeah. and you and you can and you can meet the criteria then you know so be it yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and uh your brother had reptiles and you're growing up too right yeah yeah for sure he he is really strange story because he was really into snakes and i can remember we used to go out road cruising at night to catch toads for he had uh you know hognose snakes as as a, a kid and we just drive on the local roads and try to get frogs on rainy nights and stuff to feed his hog nose. And also <sighs> I, I was with him. I was with him, you know, as a young kid looking up to my big brother, you know, three to four or five years old. And he has yellow rat snakes and all these cool things that, you know, came across the shelf on uh, that were just American made, not too much exotics at the time. But yeah, I was messing with all that stuff in his eyes. But later he actually, like when he turned 20 or so, he actually developed a fear for snakes. And what? to this day, like he still won't even hold them, you know, and uh, <laughs> he, he looks at me. He's like, wow, you kept going with this passion. He goes, I don't know what happened to me. He goes, they creep me out now. <laughs> so wow. it's kind of strange. You know, I never, <laughs> I never seen anybody like that. You always bring them back the other way. Like, you know, I watched yeah. Rob at, at Tinley when he gave his lecture and, and how he would get people that were afraid of snakes and you know and by the end of the show he had people that were scared to death of him holding them and checking them out and all you know that's usually the way it goes it's yeah. Yeah. weird for somebody to revert the other way you know <laughs> i think i sucked all the passion out of him it's all in me you know i'll take your section thank you exactly that's, that's my yeah. piece of cake right there <laughs> exactly Oh man. So can you, can you think back to like when you were younger, was there like a certain species that like just really, I think I already know the answer to this one, but um, for people who are listening, is there a species that really just like captivated you? They're like, Oh my goodness, that's, that's what I need. That's the Holy grail. That's the thing that I really want to work with. Well, when I was really young, I mean, really young and I only had field books as a guy to know even what was out there. Mm -hmm. The, the, the coup de gras was a black rat snake, believe it or not. And I couldn't even mm. fathom being able to find one. But obviously as I got older and started collecting and everything else, it was blood pythons, you know, it was just blood pythons were the animal that like, I knew that one day I had to see little heads coming out of an egg. And yes. you know that yeah. it, it was, that was just something, there was just something about that snake once, you know, everything started clicking. And then as I started becoming available, you know, they were all imports at the time when I got involved with them because um, nobody was captive breeding them. Then and every once in a while, somebody would get a gravid female from the wild that would drop eggs. And, you know, those babies, even like that, were a thousand dollars back then, you know. Yeah. And, um, so, yeah, those were the, the snake that I just knew I had to get, had to succeed with and do the best I could with those animals and figure them out. So everybody knows about him now. I mean, everybody and their brother keeps a blood python or a short tail now. <laughs> you know, but back then they were like almost as hard as bowling pythons, if you're crying out loud, you know, mm. just yeah, keeping them yeah. alive, acclimating them, trying to get them to eat. That, that was something that, you know, only the guys that were legends in the day were having any success with, you know. So, yeah, that was yeah. that was the snake for me that I really wanted to get into. I, I remember oh, seeing yeah. the first like pictures that I ever saw of blood pythons and the like the shape of their head and the eye stripes on their face. And yeah. uh, that just like really drew me in. And I was like, Oh my goodness, I'm in love with this snake. This thing's just so <laughs> yeah. And I had like a picture from a book. I had like literally cut it out of a book, which is terrible. I can't believe I did that <laughs> as a kid, but I was just like, I want this on my wall. So I like cut out a picture. Uh, I think it was of a Borneo um, and they had just like this beautiful side profile of its face and like it curled up and I was just like, Oh my goodness, I need to work with those one day. Yeah. And- it was, it, there was something about that flat head, right? When you yes, like, you yeah, sit yeah, from the yeah, side, yeah, yeah. they sat oh. flat top head like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just like almost like coffin shaped. I was just like, oh yeah. man, I need to work with those. <laughs> and and yeah. going from that, Keith, and you just did so much with the Bloods and the Short Tails. Um, you want to touch on like maybe a little bit of the stuff that you had had done with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, once I got hooked on like up until that point, I was working with like some dwarf monitors, and I was working with Sanzini, and I was working with all kinds of stuff. And you know, the collection was. You know, everybody just really had a couple pairs of this and that. Nobody really specialized in a certain species per se, really, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Barkers had literally every – and they were in Maryland at the time, but they had every species of python, I think, except for Owen Pelly um, in their collection. And that's what everybody strived for, to have, like, pairs of these and that and everything else. And once I got my first pair of wild bloods, I mean, they were, like, 25-pound – big red bloods and mm, you know yeah. i i dump them on the floor out of the bag um to try to figure out how i'm gonna like you know handle these things and this thing's just <laughs> sitting there like rock solid motionless and i'm like oh <laughs> wow that's not so bad you know i mean they're not <laughs> coiling oh, up to... and then all of a sudden that spring just unloads and like, 25 oh, yeah. pounds of snake come flying <laughs> right off the floor you know i'm like i love <laughs> Yes. oh my god you know just so, levitates right off the ground you're yeah. like oh my goodness it's so fast yeah yeah indeed so it was very cool to um you know work with those and then after that um you know crutchfield had a, a list and he said the newly rediscovered borneo blood python i'm like what the heck are these things you know what is that all about mm -hmm. so of course i had to get a pair I uh, got clearance from my wife to go ahead and order a pair of those. So I got them. And that pair is actually the pair that started the whole marble bloodline. The very first pair that I got um, wow. from Tom, um, I bred those together. And I noticed some animals that just had like a very faint speckling, very low uh, down by the belly, you know. And, and, and I was like, man, I'm going to raise these up and bring them together and see what I could get. And the next ones that generation that I produced, they were the ones that actually made it into the Bavarian magazine with the picture. And I called them marble bloods, you know, and everybody's like, what yeah. the hell? And, you know, <laughs> of course, we all got smarter and figured out, you know, short tails and the bloods and everybody started making the separations around that time. Um, but, yeah, that's that's how the whole marble line started, just with these two wild caught animals that I got from Tom. Um, they're newly rediscovered blood python. You know? <laughs> it's, That's it's crazy. It's so crazy because, like, for the people who haven't really worked with, like, wild caught anything or, like, if you haven't it's, really it's tried to breed wild caught animals, it is so tough oh, yeah. to get wild it caught is. stuff to reproduce. Just the it fact is. that you were able to do that is just, like, this huge That's feat. a massive accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and the red goodness. bloods, like, when I had the – I was getting them from um, this uh, couple up in Rochester, New York called the Hudaks. And they were an importer. I think they were around the same time Cam was getting going with bringing in bloods. And I had gotten them from them. And I got adult, you know, like I say, 25-pound animals that were, like, sketchy as hell. They they didn't trust anything, <laughs> you know. And it took a long time. And and I bred those, you know. And I wow. thought that was huge. And, and now those babies, you know, subsequently were so much easier to work with than those adults, you know. And that – Man, I'm like, man, I can just keep going with this. And that 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 lit the fire, you know. Once I saw those babies coming out, um, that just lit the fire for me to just, you know, see how far I could take everything, you know. Oh yeah, yeah most definitely. There's there's nothing like you getting in that project that you're like, oh my god, I have to work with this and seeing it come to fruition like that and just yeah. being like, Oh, that sense of accomplishment is like absolutely massive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I've I've been fortunate to experience that with you know, multiple species in my time working in the hobby for sure, which is very good. And I got that one species, which Rob knows right now, that's just giving me a hard time for you not being <laughs> able to, not being able to crack the code with those guys is just driving me nuts, you know? So hopefully before I'm done with uh, my journey here, I'll be able to uh, get accomplished in that also, and then have that one under the belt, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I'm very hopeful. Yeah, for sure. I'm very, very hopeful. Because like uh, a lot of people nowadays, when they uh, approach breeding things, the road has already kind of been paved for them and, and they can go right. online and go to a group and ask somebody. But yeah. I was listening to 
you on NPR and you're talking about, you know, back in the day when you're getting in animals, uh, you know, there wasn't any, you know, guide of, oh, this is how you keep these snakes. This is how you do this. It's so you would and try and find field guides or try to find information about them in the wild. And then you'd try to see, OK, maybe I can adjust this little thing right here. And you'd really have to, like, tinker around and figure it out to dial it in to get it to this point. And you really have to be that, you know, you're master or the, the student of the serpent mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. And, and, and understand what is right for it and what's wrong for it and kind of read its body and what it's telling you. And I think that yeah. that is, is definitely something that'll play to your advantage when it comes to the, to the bones, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, the blood pythons, like Rob, you know, for sure, like back in the day, you know, everybody's like, Oh, they live in these like swamps, swamps and they're buried and in the mud. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you got to keep them like basically in a, a closed system so the humidity is like a hundred percent and all this kind of stuff. And everybody's having all these respiratory issues. problems, you know, really and all this issues. kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I started like playing around with ventilation with them a lot more and getting away from all of that. And, you know, just by habitat manipulation, you not only got them where they were so much healthier, but they were so much calmer than mm-hmm. when you were keeping them at these high humidity, high heat. Um, you know, it was just, you know, putting them on steroids for further uh, being nervous animals to begin with, you know, and, and that's yeah. where the aggression came from. And, once you started changing that habitat, you're like, wow, this is so cool. You can actually change the demeanor of the animal just by the husbandry practices that you're applying to it, you know? So yeah. I thought that was like a really cool thing to learn with. The, and it's probably the first species that I really learned that with um, was blood pythons and short tails is seeing how you could change their demeanor just by changing the habitat, you know? Yeah. That uh, I, I, you know, back in the day, like, no, I shouldn't say back in the day, you know, back when I used to make YouTube <laughs> videos, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, um, I would get a lot of people because I would put out videos about blood pythons and short tails and stuff. And I would get a lot of people who would message me and they're like, my blood python is evil. And the first thing I would ask them is, what temperature do you have it at? Yeah. And almost every time they're like 95 degrees, 92 degrees. And I'm like, first right. of all, stop that. Don't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, stop yeah. that. Yeah. You yeah. need to bring it way down. Bring it to like 83, 83. See if it changes anything. And then, you know, two weeks later, they'd message me back. Oh, my God. It's night and day. This thing is is so much better. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it was very uncomfortable at 90. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think yeah, over yeah. here and at 90 degrees. It's not very comfortable. Yeah. Right. Seriously. Right. Yeah, it just puts everything in overload on them for sure, you know. So it was, it's definitely, you know, I went through my phase of wanting to create the next morph and breeding for this color and breeding for that color and all that kind of stuff. But, man, you start looking back at your roots, at the stuff that why you really love these animals in the first place. And that's kind of how I've drifted back to, you know, that passion, you know, and just the natural animal is fine for me i'm more into the behaviors of it and what makes it tick and how does it hunt and how does it you know do all the things that it does and those are the things that are you know i think keeping me passionate in the hobby and not getting burnt out after so many years doing all this you know yeah for sure and and you work with uh emerald tree boas and yeah, you got emeralds. bolins and some amazons yeah. and stuff yep and uh, I got blackheads and I got Walmas and I have some locality boas and I have some Jamaican boas and Ooh, uh, I have some, um, yeah, I like them guys, man. They're so cool. fast rising. <laughs> so underrated. They're so unusual oh, too. They're so beautiful. They are so beautiful. They got little quirks. So I love animals that have little quirks that you have to feed into, yes. you know, and, and they definitely have these little quirks. So I, I love them. Rob Stone has mentored me on uh, them and Jeff Murray. So, you know, Tom Crutchfield has helped me with them. And, uh, yeah, those things are really cool. Really, really, really cool for sure. And, so, and I mess with king steaks and stuff like that too. Yeah. You know? And I, I was just – I just want to touch on it real quick. But you were just saying, you know, that, that with the Jamaican bows, you've had – you've reached out to a couple different people and gotten input and stuff and, and feedback yeah. from those sort of people. I think that that is like – 
so huge and like most people just kind of like glaze right over that yeah. but like reaching out and and touching base with a couple of these people who have done these sort of things and getting a bearing i mean keith he bred so many different things you know most people would probably be like oh, oh he's he bred all everything. those things he's yeah. done everything yeah. and it's like no sometimes you just gotta you know bounce some ideas off some people and get some feedback and, and see because you know the second that you think you know everything it's like well you now you probably know way less than you think you do yeah. you know yeah, absolutely yeah, absolutely so, and you know, one thing when I was like thinking today, oh, we got the show tonight with the guys and we're talking about stuff and stuff like that. I was thinking like, you know, this, this hobby, you think, Rob, think of the people that you know, like I know you better than Jeremy. So I don't know the people Jeremy know, but think of the people we know mm. in this hobby. That is our lifelong passion. Like we're fortunate mm. to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the best of the best in this hobby. You know what For I mean? Real. And, yeah. and like, I, I, who can you talk to any better than Rob Stone and Jeff Murray and Tom Crutchville when it comes to Jamaica Bowers? You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah. And to, to, to be able to be in the hobby long enough that you have the access to those people just blows my mind. Like, I, I'm in awe of being able to do that, you know? Yes. Yeah, for sure. And that I 100% feel that it's so unusual to me because – um, you know, a lot of people don't think of that as a resource and mm. it, it so is, it is a massive resource for all sure. these people, you know, if you think about, uh, like, um, some of the guys who've been doing this for so long, you know, you got Ron St. Pierre, who's, he's still, yeah. Oh down. yeah. That guy's unbelievable. Oh, if you talk to him goodness. for five minutes, you'll be blown away. <laughs> talk to him for 10 minutes. Forget it. Yeah. Your jaw will be on the yeah. ground. Look yeah, <laughs> Tom Crutchfield. Like we went to Tom Crutchfield's place last February, and just getting a chance to like talk to him about the way that he kind of interacts with the animals on on his farm and yeah. his place. Yeah. It is just like so it was wild. Very eye opening. It's and, yeah, absolutely eye opening. And and yeah. to think that you know in in another uh, you know fifty or hundred years, it's going to be a completely different landscape. You're all you know, all these yeah. people are not going to probably not going to be around. Right. I might right. not be around, you know. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. But but to be in the reptile community right now, yeah. right now, with the amount of people that you know are still around that have been doing this for so long, you it's like a, a golden age, you know. Absolutely. You've got Kevin, you've got Keith, you've, you've got Tom Crutchfield, you've got Ron St. Pierre. You know, it is just so wild to me. Dave and Tracy Barker, come yeah, on. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. what? Yeah, Rob, we got Richard Ross. Yes, yeah, dude. And, dude, it's so wild to me because he called me on the phone and I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm talking to Richard Ross right now. Like, I was so geeked out. And yeah, he's so absolutely. Chill, he's so down to earth. I was just he like, wow. He is so down to earth. That's why I wanted to help him out as much as I could put him in, in, uh, in the direction of the people that I trust. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. For He's sure. a good dude. And, uh, yeah, I got to mention Gavin Bedford too. And Scott yes. Iper over in Australia, man, you know, I, I, I got fortunate to meet Gavin when we went over on our little excursion and through the guys I've met Scott and man, those guys too. Like, I'm just in awe when you start talking to these people, they're a whole different level. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Hell man. yeah. So, so what is your, um, what have you found is, are some of the like interesting quirks with some of the stuff that you're working with right now? Like you're talking about the Jamaican boas and I look at them and like, you know, not as many people have probably seen Jamaican boas in person or, or handled them or work with them. And I've, I've seen a couple of them, but I haven't had a ton of experience with them. And I'm just curious to like, what the, what are the little things that you see that you're like, Oh, I think that's really interesting. Well, one thing that I think is really cool about them, and most people would probably hate it, is they're very reclusive. Like, um, yes. they'll come out and perch when nobody's in the room. And, like, I have to enter the room in a very delicate manner, not to disturb them. And they're very arboreal at the size they are for me right now. So they'll be up there perched and everything else, and they'll watch me right in the room. And they literally know when I turn around to, like, check out something on the other side of the room and when i turn around they're gone oh, like dang. like they do not move that whole time i can walk right up to their cage i can be looking at them and they're rock steady solid but they have the capability to know that when i turn around is the time to move That's i find that man. fascinating yeah. that they do oh, that yeah. you yeah. know yeah because you think i can't like, see you if you don't, don't move <laughs> <laughs> but yet they know when i'm not looking at them and turn yeah. around you know it, it blows my mind 
Yeah, and, I, I, and, and for feeding, which talking to, to Paul, uh, I, I always mess up his last name, Paul Mitzfeld. He's a big uh, Madagascar guy, but he's also big with insular boas and stuff. And he's got some Jamaicans too. And a, a couple of people I talk to, they all prefer just pre-killed or defrosted, left in the cage just before yep. dark. Yep. That's just the way they like to eat. They're, they're, they're so strong. They're very capable hunters, but they definitely do not like live food. They seem to prefer just leave it in the cage. Leave me alone. I'll eat it when I'm ready. You know, mm -hmm. and amazing. they always do. They eat every night. Every time I put it in there, they'll feed, you know, but they just want it left in there. I've tried live just to see what would happen. They don't want any part of it. Shy right away mm. from it. Yeah. Shy right away. And I have so many hides. Um, you know, and, and layers and, and tubes and all kinds of stuff in there to give them security, you know? And, uh, yeah, still they won't hunt from an ambush point or anything like that. They just want that prey laid in there dead and they'll come out and need it, which makes you wonder, like, is there something going on in the wild that, you know, maybe they're, yeah, what's the reason? For I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are they scavenging exactly. on? Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I wonder about that. You know, so mm -hmm. I just find them fascinating. And when you start really being able to check one out and look at each individual scale and how it merges into the different colors oh. and all, it's just mind blowing. It's yes. mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And how they fade from that, you know, they can be either a nice yellow or a nice orange up by orange the head. Red. Yeah. yeah. And then they fade to that dark tail. And I just mm -hmm. love that when an animal's got like three different animals sewn like together. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I got those too, man. I love them too. Oh, well, I, those things are so interesting to me. And like, I feel like, uh, they, they don't get enough credit. The uh, corrals. For I love them. Oh, yeah. Since oh, yeah. I, since I've been working yes. with them, I've, I've had two litters with my pair now. And um, awesome. I love them to death. I love them to death. They got these huge black marble eyes, like a, oh, yes. a great yes. white shark, you know? Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and they're another one that they have a very unique um, personality. You know, they're, they're not super aggressive animals. Then they got the size and the dentures to defend themselves, but they <laughs> seem to be more like, you know, chill and laid back than definitely uh Hortolinus, you know, they, yeah. they definitely don't want to, <laughs> you know, be coming common. at you. Yeah. Like they, and the annulated bow is like, the annulated bow is I work with too. They're all like puppy dog tame. Like you reach right in and take them right out. No problem. Yeah. We, yeah. we have some annulatus at, at nerd and they are they're, super they're chill. Super they chill. don't care at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah, really it's cool it's too. Definitely, definitely a nice, uh, nice change Contrast. from the from the horse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, for sure. You know, I've seen captive bred uh, Amazon Tribo as the you know if you handle them you know gently, really they're regular. they're yeah. really great. Yeah, that I mean yeah, that yeah. is true because actually I I have an Amazon from Keith and it is my most chill, chill. yeah Amazon. I think that once we get in a couple generations into captive breeding with them, I think it's going to be like a lot of the other stuff where they're much more tolerant to being handled. Yeah. And, and you know what I just kind of realized in the last couple of days, uh, I have, you know, f some um, Gulf Coast reptile, the line of the hypos, you know, Ooh. that would produce the leucistic. leucistic. Yeah. And um, I've noticed, though, that um, the, the babies from that individual pair are super mellow animals. You know, mm. I were in, remember when Tiger Retex came out and everybody's like, oh, there's such a uh, mellow yes. retex. Yeah, and everybody yeah, yeah. was like, you know, Tracy's like, I think it's just because people think they're cool and they hold them more than the regular tick, so they yeah. calm them down. You know? <laughs> but I don't know. Some about these hypos, they definitely just the scene. Not they, they'll still come at you and everything, but they're very reluctant to strike. Hmm. So I don't know that's what's going on with that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's all cool. And I, I've gotten into bull snakes. I like these big red bull snakes. Yeah, I've got some of those. Kankakee. Yeah. Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I yeah. Um, King Kingsville. Yeah, Kingsville uh, Reds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The Kingsville Reds. I got um one of the tiger ones from a guy uh, out in Colorado that Rob knew, uh, which is like so fire engine red already. It, it's Ooh, just such yeah, a cool yeah. looking animal. So Picture yeah, I really like them. And rhino rats. I got rhino rats. I like rhino rats yes. a lot. Those are very cool. Yeah, just oh, a yeah. little like eclectic thing and. Man, I just keep the keep now, and like I'll say, you know, this year I, I'm always going to try bowl, and I'm always going to be trying to breed them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the the main ones that I concentrate really trying to breed 
every year is because I have so many of them as the emeralds. Other than that, I look at other pairs and I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll try you this year. Maybe I won't. Maybe I you won't. Know? And, and I like that. I like not having that pressure on me or putting the pressure on them to always be producing and just yeah. enjoying them for what they are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like, that is the ultimate that's the goal. goal. That's the like goal. really <laughs> is the ultimate goal as a keeper is like, you want to have what you want to enjoy working with and everything, but you, you want to still have that element of just enjoyment for keeping exactly. the animals and, and not being pressured. Just like you said to, to, Oh my God, you got to breed. Oh, I'm freaking out. Cause it's girls not going this year. Or I just whatever. need to produce one clutch of scrubs and I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you'll yeah. never hear from Rob ever again. I mean, you'll probably hear from me again, but it'll, it'll be a lot less pressure on what I need to actually do because I just that, look at them and I'm like, Oh my God, I love these things so much. That's how I feel with the bull and I, you know, and mm-hmm. it's the same thing. I, I just want to do it once. Like, I don't want to be a mass producer of a bull and I or anything. I just would like to do it once to do it, experience the whole thing and just enjoy them for what they are at that point, you know. But I'd love to get them in other breeders' hands that I know would love to be working with them right now and don't have access to them. But I trust them to be able to maybe reproduce them and get more in captivity. And also, you know, that's a big thing, too, like, you know, Jeff and Tom and all of and talking to Rob about the Jamaican boas, you know, and, you know, keeping them established in captivity, you know, yeah. and, and just passing them around to other people that want to work with that species and, and not looking at it in a monetary sense at all, you know, or green Sanzinia. I have a pretty good group here that people have actually entrusted me with to work with because I've bred them in the past and on. We're looking to get some new bloodlines and man, I enjoy projects like that now way more than, you know, producing the first color of this or the first color of that. For me, that's just where my head's at. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that this is where I'm at. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm. And I'm about it. (laughs) I'm just, I'm I'm about, because that really is like the goal. Yeah. You know? And I I too, I too deal with the uh, eclectic collection. (laughs) How many species, Jeremy? Uh, 16 or 17. (laughs) So... I, I feel that from from Amazon tree boas to bloods and short tails to different colubrids and I've I've fallen madly in love with uh, with Pituophis and uh, and Mex Mex Kings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, man, there's dude when you when you get a, a little pit to like start to use its brain mm. like. Yeah. And it starts to just recognize everything that's that's happening, and it, it's not in like that immediate like, holy crap, somebody's trying to touch me, and it, right, yeah. you know, and then they're yeah, actually yeah. like, oh, okay, all right, you're cool, and you just see that kind of click, man. I I could just sit back and hold a, a bull or a pine or a gopher for freaking ever for an entire you know what day. I, you, know, you know what I really like about them and uh, the rhino rats and uh, even the uh, uh, Mellendorf is, uh, I mm-hmm. like the way they kind of like you know the classic jurassic park velociraptor when they're cruising their cage and they see movement in, and they don't like turn their body like boids don't like just turn their head and cock it in that no. yeah. way to get <laughs> one eye looking at you you know and, yeah. and i think that's so cool with colubrids how they do that you know and yes and, uh the bull snakes as they get bigger and you can really see that head doing that oh man i mm. love that oh yeah that is yep. so cool Man, I I remember the the ultimate moment for me with with bull snakes was when I got my very first uh white big white sided bull from from a buddy of mine. He was like, oh, I just he's like, I'm getting out of snakes. You, you know, is this something you'd be interested in? And I was like, Yeah, man, sounds like a cool snake. And I didn't know what the hell I was getting into, but that first moment opening up that enclosure and just that <laughs> coming out yeah. of this drawer and it sounded like a lion's roar because it's in a big it's in a big tub yep. and it's just echoing through the the slot in the rack and you're like what the hell did i just put in this thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i was like oh my god this is the coolest snake ever and then you know you start to start to figure out that intelligence once they once they mellow out they yeah. kind of recognize you're no threat to them it, man they, there's something else yeah 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 for sure I, and you know i i what's old is new again too to to us as we're getting older as keepers like you know i i drifted away from north american species thinking oh i gotta get exotic stuff you know but now i'm looking i'm like a bull snake check out these huge bull snake i mean these things (laughs) live in the united states you know (laughs) and and you you can't even put your hand around them and touch your fingers you know it's like 
you know, I'd love to get like some, uh, I got a local guy that has some really nice, like Texas indigos. I wouldn't even mind having a pair of Ooh, those right now. Try you know? yes. Yeah. I mean, Rob, I, you probably heard me on the NPR. So I was talking about back in the day, you used to be able to go into pet stores and foot. buy, yeah, you used to buy <laughs> indigos by the foot. It was $10. That's so foot. crazy. Yeah. Jeez. Uh. It was. That's wild. I remember I went to when I was younger, my family used to go to Florida like almost every year. And um, one of the times we had gone down there, I think it was at Bush Gardens or something. They had um, somebody who was involved with the Indigo Conservation Project. They had brought mm-hmm. a big like seven foot Eastern yeah. Indigo to to like just teach people about them. And they had it because it was like a kind of a cool, cooler morning. So they had it tucked up underneath their jacket. And then all of a sudden they pull out this like I, like ebony, dark, black snake. And it had the red throat. And I was yeah, just like, yeah. oh, my goodness. What is that? Yeah. And you can't even believe it's in North America, right? Right. Yeah, and it's yeah, wild. Exactly. You, could, you could go down there and theoretically find one. Like, oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> that is wild to me. And like one of the things that I really want to do, like COVID definitely messed it up because 2021, I was had a lot of plans for like traveling around the U S and field herping and that kind of got ruined, but I'm looking forward to the future. I really, really, really want to get down South and do more field herping because just the, I went to Arizona, but it's probably like five years ago now, but I went to Arizona and I saw so many cool things. Like I didn't even find yeah. any venomous snakes, but I just saw so many cool things. And just to be able to go out there and I, I had found a pit out there and, you know, doing or the yellow giant, yellow, hairy scorpions. And yeah, I yeah. saw a million Chuck Wallace, like Chuck Wallace out the oh, yeah. wazoo. <laughs> but Did you see any road runners or road runners in Arizona? I know they're in Texas and, and whatnot, but I don't know if they travel up to Arizona or not. I don't think I saw any. I saw Man. tortoises and like you can, lots of Yeah, you gotta check out a Roadrunner in the wild. I'm telling you, Rob, talk about Velociraptor. It's right oh. there, man. Oh it my is goodness. right there. They, they they're insane. I love them. I spent a lot of time herping in uh Texas. My sister and uh her husband were stationed down there and oh man, those were one of the big highlights whenever I could find a a road runner and just watch it for a while. It was insane. That's so cool. I, I definitely want to hit East Texas because there's this uh, locality of broad banded water snakes. That's down on the Eastern oh, side of Texas oh, yeah. and it is like fire engine red and like yes. black bands on it. And I'm like, why are people not breeding these things? They're, yeah, in the West exactly. and they're like, they're not a giant species. They get like two and a half or three foot long and yeah. the water, Nerodi are smart. Like they are, they have a high yeah. visual acuity and you can keep them communally and they do great in like, you know, if you want to do a bio, Active vivarium, yeah, yeah. they do great on all that sort of stuff. So it like blows my mind that people aren't, you know, working with them. And if you saw the colors in some of the locales, like uh, people who are listening at home, pause right now, search broad banded water snake and just scroll a little bit through the images and you'll see yeah. ones that are like bright red and orange. They almost look like a copperhead, but like They're with beautiful. red on them. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, I have to go to Texas just to see some. I don't even want to collect <laughs> them. I just want to like see some. Oh, in the absolutely. Wild. Yeah. Man. I, I'm, I'm so down with, like you say, native herbs now. I, I mean, I went to Australia and I'm blown away and I cannot wait to go back there. But yes. I'm really starting to think about we have venomous lizards. You know what I mean? We have right. snakes that rattle their tails. We have giant alligator snapping turtle, like stuff that we kind of me personally took for granted for a few years because I'm thinking of all the exotic stuff that I can't see. And oh, I can see that anytime. But you think like making friends worldwide, you realize how much this stuff is really so cool. You know, yes, you're talking yeah. to Nipper Reed or, or Scott and they're, you know, you're talking about well, our local stuff and they're like, that's gotta be insane. I can't wait to see one of those. And you're like, really? And you start thinking about it. <laughs> right next like, I've been seeing these for <laughs> yeah. 20 years. But yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to, to someone from outside of the United States, like if, if ringneck snakes were from the other side of the world, people would be losing their minds. Right. Like, yeah. It's charcoal on top and it's got an orange and red fire belly and it's got like <laughs> yeah. a ring around its neck how does not yeah. why doesn't everyone want these things and it's just yeah like, yeah, oh, yeah you know we take them for granted because it's like you know oh i see like 20 hours a day so you know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah 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 for sure no it's all good stuff man i i love it all you know and uh yeah rob you got to get to australia man you know uh, one thing i one thing i want to say rob 
one thing I love about you is I listen to you on NPR and, and dude, let's face it. You see so much stuff because of where you work and what you do. Right. Yeah. And you have that fire and that passion. Dude, that's the people I want to be around. You know what I mean? I don't yes. care if somebody's only in this hobby for five years, if they got that passion, dude, I want to be their friend. You know what I yeah. mean? That, Hell that yeah. real yeah. passion for the animal and all that kind of stuff, something that fires you up just you know, you want to talk to people that get you fired up, man. You're you're definitely the dude that'll do that. So I just want to tell you, I love that about you, man. I appreciate I'm, that. I'm man. seconding that that motion. 100%. <laughs> it's, it's so weird to me because like I get geeked out about stuff, and then sometimes I'm feeling like you know burnt out or, or like whatever, or like you know tired or just like exhausted, and all of a sudden I like you know talk to someone and just like they get like a little excited about something. I'm like, oh my god, okay, I get, I got it, I got it. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> But what you're saying, yeah, we all got burned out, but getting that fire relit is the key, you know. Yes, yeah, that's that's kind of what Reptile Expos have been been to me historically is where I get to go and kind of like reset that fire a little bit. And if I'm feeling a little bummed out about a project or you know this thing or that thing, you know, going and just getting to talk to some of the people who you know get me all jazzed up and have a little bit of that energy too, I just like that really keeps me going. That's really what I try to use like social media, like Facebook for. You know what I mean? Like, you know, because I I can talk to Nipper Reed. I can talk to Graham. I can talk to Gavin. I can talk to people from around the world and and light that fuse again. You know what I mean? So that's really I try to use it in a positive Mm -hmm. way because it can be very negative. And, uh, you know, oh, that's, yeah. that's oh, yeah. what I use it for. You know, I don't know how you guys do it, man. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's tiring. It's, rough. <laughs> it's definitely rough. That's for sure. Yeah. I, and I, on my personal page, I try and keep it pretty light, but still, oh, my goodness. It is. Yeah. yeah there's yeah, yeah. there's people got some opinions. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I, tr- I try to stay pretty pretty quiet pretty neutral right <laughs> yeah. but keith we have to go field herping is what needs to happen because oh absolutely man i got some spots down here because i know you got that eye and like you smell the snakes out man oh, i got some yeah. spots <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I got some spots with like some eastern hog nose down here that you know Ooh. i get random friends will send me a picture what is this i'm like are you kidding me, are you kidding like, me right now? <laughs> they, they literally found it like you know three miles from my house and i'm like i am oh. still looking for one in new jersey yeah. please <laughs> tell me where you found it so i know if i put you in these areas rob oh, you'll probably yeah. uh root them out so. we'll do something and then well, i i know some spots where we can see some some cool new england stuff yeah Cop- yeah copperheads and, and all sorts of yeah. stuff yeah Man, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I generally just go out with Teresa and, and we go hiking and we see, you know, all the kind of stuff we see. But Rob and uh, and uh, Eric and Owen taking me to Australia, you know, and going with these guys that are all the passion in the world for these animals. It takes you to a, like another level. Like somebody, yes. we're, we're driving down the road and all of a sudden in the center of the road, we're always looking for snakes in Australia, you know, and all of a sudden like in the middle of the road just laying there and i'm like frilly like oh, it was a frilled dragon. you know for four american guys to see a frilled dragon for the first time in a while all at the same time like that it was just Geeked. it just oh, yeah. yeah forget it man it just blows you away you know and then like gavin this spring he sends me a picture he went in his backyard and he's walking around and he found a female laying eggs and he goes, Oh, I thought you wow. might like this. I'm like, are you kidding me? A frilled dragon in a wild laying eggs? Of course I want to see that. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. Yeah. One of my, one of my friends from Maine, she um, got married to someone who lives in Australia and she moved there. Mm-hmm. And she, I was just like, you know, I was friends with her. So I was following her on social media and all of a sudden she posted a video of her garden. She's like, Oh, there's this like weird little lizard rooting around in my garden. And I was like, are you serious right now? She had a family of shinglebacks in her garden. Uh, and she's oh my just God. like, I see them at like every other morning they'll come through and they'll like eat a little bit of the bugs. They'll like root around in the garden and then they go off and hide for the rest of the day. And I'm like, wow. Oh my God. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. Dude, I, if that was my yard, I would couldn't wait to get home from work. I'd set up a chair, <laughs> you know, and just sit there and oh, watch. Dude, just watch them. 
Uh, yeah, that would be insane. Because it's not just one. She'll see like a couple big ones and then like one or two ones that are like half the size of, of the Damn. adults. And Shingle bags like, are like my favorite skink Steve. Really? So like, yeah. yeah I'm not much of a skink so cool. guy, but like the first time I ever saw a picture of a shingle back, I was like, that thing shouldn't be real, but I really <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I feel like yeah. if I went to Australia, I'd be so torn on what I would like be most excited about because like I would definitely want to see a scrub, but I yeah. like absolutely love death adders and yeah. i would be like so ginned up if i could see some wild death adders like i would I'll be so you, excited i'll tell you the areas that we were walking in they they are you know in that area and it was kind of nerve-wracking because we, our main focus was to find out owen pelly but you're walking through this leaf litter and you're like Ooh. man they definitely could be like right here as we're rooting around this stuff you know Damn, and blending yeah. in and we went to this Crocosaurus Cove and they had one in there and um, in, uh, in one of the display cages and we're checking it out. We're like, man, that leaf litter that we're walking around and like you literally could be an inch away from one and probably not even yeah, see it, see you it. know? Yeah. 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 But that would have been uh, a really cool find for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely surreal. It's definitely surreal. I mean, we found the echidna. I found an what? echidna. Yeah. Yes. Really? It's the craziest thing. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to see one of those in person like that in the wild, it was crossing the road and we stopped the car and it just stopped and kind of balled up. But I had a lot of confidence that we weren't going to mess with it. And we just wanted to look at it and take a couple pictures. And I'm looking at it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We're looking at it. <laughs> you know, it's just, oh, man. In the and, wild, and, like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that element geeks of being me out. in the wild yeah. is, is totally different. Yeah, yeah. that geeks me out. And, and, and one thing, like, me and uh, Rob and Eric and Owen always talk about is, like, when you're in the habitat of that animal, like, the things that you pick up on to mm-hmm. advance your husbandry at home are, like, mind-blowing. Like, you literally pick up, like, four years of mistakes in captivity you can pick up in a week being in the mm-hmm. environment with those animals, you know what I mean? Which is huge for me, you know, just trying to figure out where these Owen Pelly were and how they're surviving and how they're living and everything else like that. If, if I ever had a chance to work with them, like, I feel like I have so much more knowledge in just – picking one up and reading a book you know what i mean yeah for yeah, sure for sure for sure that's that's kind of why i need to go to borneo and sumatra before it's all gone <laughs> yeah well, matt wants to go man so you and matt would be a perfect team to go there yes. that's for sure I, I and it's a little bit less expensive than australia so i need to do that one <laughs> yeah. i need to do that one first and then i can do australia you'd be surprised rob i went to australia check this out i went from new jersey to denver colorado to meet with Rob Stone and we hung out for a day and he took me behind the scenes at the zoo out there, which was insane. Komodo dragons, anyone? Yes. And then, yes. yeah. And then we, I went from there to uh, uh, San Diego. And then from there we flew to Australia, uh, with Brisbane and then up to Darwin. And I got round trip. Check this out. Round trip for a thousand dollars. What? 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 For a thousand dollars. Wow. If you watch, if you watch the flights and just keep watching them and watching them, watch them, you can get a good deal. And man, that Qantas is an unbelievable airline. I felt like I was in a hotel. They serve you so much food. That <laughs> it, like I gained five pounds on that flight, dude. The longest, <laughs> the longest flight was fourteen hours, but I mean, they made it enjoyable on that that airline. It was really cool, but. Yeah, man, you feel like you're going to the other side of the world. It was 23 hours of flying, you know. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. Definitely cool. Yeah i i i got I got stressed six hours going from here to L. A. So damn. Yeah. Oh really? I, I, nah, but if see, there's good food, if there's good food, man, oh, I'll, I'll shut food. my mouth and sit down. <laughs> you see, the, the entire time for me would just be like reading field guides and being like, "Oh, I really hope we see one of these. Oh, I really hope we see one of these." <laughs> See, that was what was so awesome about Rob because Rob Stone, man, he did all the research and you'd look over your shoulder and see him in the seat doing exactly that, you know? Yes. <laughs> and then when yes. we got there, man, he took us to all the best places. Oh, it was insane. I mean, That's there was awesome. obviously months of plan- planning on his part before we went, him and Eric, you know? And me and or- Owen just kind of tagged along and like, they're bringing us all these spots that they spent months and months figuring out where would be <laughs> the best time of the day and everything else to be in this one spot to look for it, you know? It was cool. It was very cool. So very surreal. That's so Damn. awesome. See, I feel like I'm not as great at planning things. So I would just be like, I'm going to go there and I'm 
<laughs> and, uh, hope for the best. <laughs> you know what? A lot, a, a, a lot of people that do that, they'll find the coolest stuff. So you never know. Yeah, that is you know, that is true. Know. That yeah. is true. Yeah. yeah. When I went to Arizona, I found, like I was saying, I saw a million chuck wallas. I saw lots of banded geckos. I saw desert tortoises. I caught a patch nose snake. I saw all sorts of like whip tail wow. lizards, and the uh, we saw like it was a lesser crowned uh, horn toads, the horn lizards. Wow, we saw a bunch yeah. of those, and that was like just how cool are they? Yeah, so cool because my mom was like, my mom lived in Arizona for like a year and a half. And she's like, I really want to take you out to like this one rock outcropping. It's like kind of near the hospital that I was working at. And like on my break, I would go out there and I would just see like lots of little lizards running around. And so me and her go out there and we're just kind of like walking around. And I see a bunch of like whiptail lizards and like a bunch of um, the, not fence lizards, but um, I can't remember the name of them. The, the curly stuff. tails. Yeah. Like the oh, curly yeah, tails yeah, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, I see like just the side of this horn tail, and I was like, "Oh my god, I cannot yeah. move! I'm gonna scare it." And the thing our, didn't our care, it, yeah. yeah, right. And so I, I like tried to sneak closer to it, and it's just staring at me. It didn't care. And like once I got like within five feet, it like ran up underneath a spiny bush, and I was like, "Oh." Damn it! And so I'm sitting there, like trying to figure out how to get it out from underneath this bush. And I look over to the side, and there's like another one on the rock, just chilling there, just looking at me. <laughs> and they they were they didn't care at all. And I saw probably like five of them all just chilling in this little area. And they were like they didn't really care. Like I literally went up and like touched one, and it was like wow. don't touch me. And it like ran three foot, but then it like just stopped and turned around and looked at me, <laughs> and just like casually looking at me and just being like, oh, I wonder what you're doing out here. And I'm just like losing my mind. Look at this freaking thing. It's so cool. <laughs> how big are they, Rob? How, how big is that species? The one that I found was like probably five inches or so. Not, not. Mm -hmm. huge, yeah, yeah. But it, it fit right in your hand. And um, I, it did not squirt blood at all. And I learned, you know, I just learned like yeah. within the last year or two, mm -hmm. not all species of horned lizards squirt blood. There's only like a couple species right. that do that. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. right hmm. yeah yeah so weird yeah so cool but so i was so cool. geeked out about that i was just like oh my god these things are amazing and then yeah. when i went to yeah. sedona i was just like oh my god there's so many cool species i can find here and i didn't find anything i was so bummed <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that that is always the risky run you know yep, but yeah it's just like fishing man if you love it and just being out there and just enjoying out that is worth it yep exactly and you, in the habitat that they're in you're still learning you know yes that's yeah. true that yeah even true not that. finding anything is still finding something because you can learn things from what you're you know what you're not finding you're like exactly. okay well they don't like these conditions right exactly. here. exactly exactly <laughs> you know exactly. people see like a lot of my field herping pictures and like oh my god you find tons of stuff and i'm like i don't post pictures on the days where i go out and i'm just you know i don't find anything <laughs> right. it doesn't happen that often but it still happens sometimes where i'll go out and just yeah. not see anything yeah 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 yep Oof. if people only knew yeah there's been summers just where i go out to like all my regular house. spots and i don't see anything and I'm yeah the like, sad oh, woes uh, of field herping it's just like fishing man <laughs> yeah it, I like is. Fishing it really is bit, but like i don't know i've i've as i've got older i'm just like i like to just like look at things so if i can see the fish in the water that's cool enough for me yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's fair yeah. yeah yeah just having that moment yeah in nature yeah, yeah. Is there any particular place that you're like, besides Australia, that you're like, oh, man, I really want to go field herping there? Yeah, you know, you know, the cool thing about Australia is I feel safe there, but I would love to go to Papua New Guinea. You know, Ooh. obviously, with, with I would love to go to Papua with Ari. Obviously, he's begged me a couple times to go with him. And, yes. man, I would love to do that. And it's just the political climate there is keeping me from it. And, it, you know, some people are telling me, screw that, just do it you know you only live once and then Teresa I'm, I'm gonna be, be one like, of those people keep yeah you should just do it I'm just gonna say <laughs> yeah, I really that would like definitely I just the amount of information that you would gather from being there and then like yeah, I would look no. forward to seeing your posts about it because I really enjoy reading your posts on yeah. Facebook about stuff like yeah. that yeah yeah uh, yeah, I could just, you could just get me in their habitat and let me sit there. I would yes. be fine. You know what I mean? And yeah. just kind of soak it all in. I would be fine with that. And to actually see one in the wild, forget it. I'd probably scream and you could hear me in the States, you know, <laughs> but you know, just, uh, I would love to, cause Ari's videos, when he sends me a video, like I pick up so much little stuff on those videos. Even I can't even mm -hmm. imagine if I was there to actually feel it and experience it and, smell it and taste it and just live it yeah, yeah exactly yeah. 
that's what you need. You know, we were talking about these multi-species collections, which is where I'm at now, but you have to admit, you know, if you're just a single species collection, how much more you figure out so much faster, you know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. if it was just available to any collector, I mean, even with Kevin's resources, putting it bet together a, a bull and eye collection these days is near impossible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To have a substantial group of animals to work with and try to figure them out. It's just so hard. That's why I hope, you know, everybody keeps sharing the information. So it's kind of like a joint effort between us all, but yeah, getting into their habitat and actually seeing it and figuring it all out. And you go with somebody like Ari, who's got that same passion. I just can't even imagine the stuff we could learn, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. I want to, I want to backtrack just a second. Cause Rob, Rob kind of hinted, uh, like when you make the, those posts on Facebook, uh, I definitely really admire uh, the the depth at which you go in on, on some of the species posts that I've seen you put up there. I, I so I want to know like what what was the uh, the thought process behind like you know what I'm going to type up this mini novel real quick about <laughs> about a certain species because I mean that is a wealth of knowledge. You would um, be that, surprised. That it's like something something just has to click with me uh, at the moment. Either I'm in my mm -hmm. collection or all of a sudden some new kind of theory pops into my head or whatever like that. And like, really I bang those things out in like five minutes. Like it, it just, I, I just crank it. Like once the juices start flowing, like I just kind of go with it yeah. and I post it hoping that I don't get any of the flack that you guys were talking about <laughs> earlier because there's, just, yeah. there's always haters out there, you know? So I try yeah. to be very, diplomatic in the way i present things so that there's no like argumentative it's just a, it's really i'm just trying to get people to think outside the box or yes. you know just give you i'm just giving you my opinion on this subject you know what i mean so it's my opinion or whatever it is but dude it, it's like uh yeah. I, I found that i really just love to write and write something about something that i'm passionate about is I don't know. It's like, uh, it's just such a release for me. I, I envision it's probably like an artist when they have a vision to make a painting or anything like that. You know, they, yeah. they, they have it in their head and they have to get it on the paper. And, you know, I've had stuff in my head at night. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, I got to write about that tomorrow. And then the next day it's gone. You know, yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. shit, what, no, what, yes, what, no. what, you know, Dude, the number so, of times I've had like uh, uh, so ideas for songs and stuff at night, and I'm just like, oh man, I do I have to walk to the studio? And uh, I literally got to the point where I would make sure I had my phone close enough to me on the nightstand, where if I got an idea, I could like sing it really quick into my phone and then go back yeah. to sleep, so I could at least get some kind Semblance. of idea of what it, where I was going at that point in time. So I yeah, totally dude. understand that. I, I love, I wish I, I, I am so into music, like, but I have no talent at all, you know, and I envy <laughs> you guys to death because Eric Burke will just pick up the, his guitar and start playing. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, you know, it just blows my mind that the, the, I don't even know what it is. I want to say talent, but it's not really talent. It's a passion. It's just the, the fire inside you guys that it just comes so effortlessly, you know, to, to somebody that it's just natural for. And yeah. I look at like, you know, us, Rob, me, all these other guys that we know, that's us with reptiles, you know, that's our passion, yeah. that's our talent, that's our, that's our thing, that's our fire, you know, but yeah, yeah musicians, yeah. man, I respect the hell out of you guys, that's awesome shit, man, I love that. Hell yeah. See, I think that you should make a, a memoir notebook. Uh, because I would love to buy that. I just want like a I, year's <laughs> worth of Keith's idea. Hell yeah. I would, I, I, I have them all, Rob. I actually do. I have them all. And I, I you know, I do everything in word when I'm typing it out and yes. I have them. Yes. Yes. I, okay, I always, so you, we should I always that up. say it, you know, I, I say rambling, ramblings of <laughs> ramblings of an old keeper or something like that, you know, <laughs> and just, Anything I've ever written, you know, my one chapter may be on Bull and I, next chapter may be on uh, make poking fun at us in the hobby or whatever. You know, I just I do save it all, so I do have it all. Yes, so we Hell need to yeah, set up a good. link, and it's gonna be if people want to get a copy of that, they'll pay ten dollars, and that will all go into <laughs> sending Keith to New Guinea to see there you go. in the wild. There you go, because <laughs> I think that that would be a great idea. Oh, I'm just 100%. saying. <laughs> A hundred percent. I want to. I want to read the really long Facebook I, post that comes after I, a trip to New Guinea. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That'll be the yeah, first yeah, chapter yeah. of the next book. 
Yeah. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, no, I man. love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. So we're uh, we're in closing. We're encroaching on our hour mark. Um, but before we uh, let you go, Keith, we ask all of our guests one final question to kind of wrap things up. So that question is what in the realm of reptiles, be it something in your collection at home or something you've seen while scrolling the interwebs, because that's basically what our entire lives have been reduced to these days. Uh, what in the realm of reptiles has you excited about reptiles? Ooh, I'd have to say um, in the States, we have a lot of reptile parks that are about to open up that are going to be mind blowing. Yes, and I am more yes. than excited to go visit every one of them. We got Quetzal and Ari doing what they're doing in Texas. We have Graham doing what he's doing. We have Ty Park doing Ty what Park. he's doing. Yes. You know, like we have all these big reptile facilities that, you know, for me, really, the only place I have that's within distance for me right now, I got to come up and see you, Rob, by the way, but yes. is Alligator Adventure in South Carolina, you know, and it's really focused on crocodilians, but they do have some other species there. Mm -hmm. But it's the only like reptile park that I know of local to me that I can get to, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to these parks. So, you know, not only can I go to Texas and go herping with Ari, but I'll have this insane reptile park to go visit so those are the things right now that have me super excited um oh, for sure here for and, it and yeah i think it's going to open up the uh open up a lot of people's eyes to that um natural world of reptiles versus just the have it in your house as a cool pet thing you know mm -hmm. yeah most definitely most definitely and we need that I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any Education to exactly. needs to be out there. It really does. Yeah, yeah, I can't yeah, wait because sure. I was listening to Graham Battison talk about his parks and he said they're going to have a, a heavy emphasis on educating people and teaching people about them. And like, that is, that's my jam. I love that. Yeah. So I cannot wait to see what they do with that. Rob, Rob there's no doubt in my mind because he's mentioned it to me um, that he's going to have folks like you come down and give a talk. And he's, you know, I have a guy, you know, passionate keepers and and people that have stuff to share he's going to have them come and invite them and come to the different parks and give a lecture and then talk and all that so that. yeah i think that that'll be, be really cool yeah, yeah for sure mm. yeah. and keith you got to come up and visit i'm telling you man. i am yes. i am me and, <laughs> yes. me and Teresa keep talking about it and i've been thinking about hitting you up and seeing what day would be good to do it and we're going to do it for sure coming up yeah mm, i'm yeah. excited for that if, if it's not like super soon if it's like like right around mother's day or after we can go field herping so True. <laughs> True. Saying, good, i'm, I'm yeah. not saying you know just to I put know. it off but you know <laughs> this, the closer we get to then i can definitely show you some really cool stuff in the wild no that'd be cool because we could make a longer weekend out of it you know and come up yeah. and get a hotel and that'd be cool for sure. Boom. Hell awesome. Yeah. So if people want to find out more about you, where should they do it? I mean, hold on before you, before you say that everyone who's listening right now, if you want to hear more about Keith, you should go to the Morelia Python radio uh, episode that they just did with Keith. Yes. Uh, recently, you should listen to that. It is so interesting. So much more information than what we just talked about right now. And honestly, I listened to it twice already and I'm probably going to uh, listen thanks. to it again just because there's so much good information <laughs> in there. I, I honestly just loved it. It was so amazing. Oh, well, um, thank you. And uh, so if people want to find out more about you, where should they go besides just that episode? Uh, just, just contact me on Facebook and, um, uh, I'm just going to tell you straight up. If I scroll your timeline and there's not like at least eight reptile posts in your first 10 posts, I'm probably going to not accept because yes. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm just looking for folks that are on there to, you know, that have the passion for the reptiles. And, and, uh, so yeah, Facebook, uh, just find me on there and, and that's probably the best access for me. Awesome. So, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on tonight, yes, man. You, we Keith. appreciate it. I enjoyed so it. Much. Thanks, guys. I look forward to uh, seeing you guys. Yeah. Hell okay, yeah. man. Take care. Have a nice night. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.